comic, and I used to hang out in the comic circuit. I've done radio, TV, and... All right, fine, so you're giving me a self-promotional tour. What, what is the point of your call, though? I don't get it. But the, the point is, is that the, I just really related to the article, and I really related to, to what you were Okay, but my about. point, Nick, Nick, I actually said the opposite. I said that creative people function despite the neurosis, not, a, not because of it. That's what I was saying. Well, it, it me, it, it... All right, thanks for the call. Moody neurotics are more likely to be creative geniuses, study says. And I said the opposite may be true. We like to think, oh, he's a crazy, oh, look at her, look at the hair is all, look at her, she chain smokes, she's got tattoos, and she drinks incessantly. That makes her a genius? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't buy it. The really creative, fine artists that I've known or the ones that I've respected are generally very buttoned-down people, incidentally. And they don't wear it on their, on their sleeve, so to speak, to show you how creative they are. WABC, Wayne, your opinion counts. What's on the Savage Nation today? Hi, Michael. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that the most creative person that I've ever met personally is, is uh, Isaac Asimov. Oh, he was wonderful. What did he write? 120 books. Oh, incredible body of work. Uh, both. Did you know? Did you know him personally? On fiction, no. I, I met him briefly. Uh, he was making an appearance at. Uh, you know, it's interesting. The people who are who are Lilliputians compared with me try to ridicule me because I've written 30 books. They think that's a mark of not being a good writer. Asimov wrote over 100 books. What are you going to criticize him for being prolific? No, certainly not. No, well, you see, this is the problem with, with Lilliputians. And the Lilliputian never understands what, what, what Lilliputianism is. They're way over their heads. So thank you for that call. WABC BJ, welcome to the program. Give us your opinion on any subject. Go ahead, please. Well, Doctor, you're right about uh, uh, the neuroses married to uh, great creativity. In fact, the neuroses actually, uh, in the performing arts, I believe, the neuroses actually helps hone the creative energies. And yeah, but what you say, hold it, you say I'm right when I said the opposite is what I believe. This is two callers in a row who didn't hear me. I said that the article says that moody neurotics are more likely to be creative geniuses, and I'm saying that they're geniuses despite their neuroses, not because of their neuroses. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. All right, fine. Well, you can disagree, fine. But I will tell you that that revelation by Aldous Huxley or Laura Huxley that I read when I was young helped me from falling down the rat hole of aping the neurotic behavior that artists thought that they were supposed to behave. Yeah. That, that, that. You know, that's what I'm saying. It's like people in the conservative movement think that they have to ape being super conservative. They have to out conservative each other to prove their credentials. That's the same kind of uh, poseur that I'm talking about. No, that 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 I I, I would find very uh, credible. I think um, so. Going, it's like the idiots in the Black Lives Mooder, Black Lives Neuter movement, or whatever it's called. They're now urinating and crapping on the American flag. Now, do they actually think that they're going to start a national movement by... It, it's disgusting. They're going to, they said that we're going to start tearing down American flags. And there's pictures of some of these low-life nobodies who've done nothing of any use for the human species wiping their behinds with the American flag. This is an example of stupidity, vulgarity, ugliness, and uselessness. Okay? This is not an example of creativity. You understand the difference? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. All right, hour number two of The Savage Nation. We are at cruising altitude, 45,000 feet, 400 knots, uh, whatever, and I'm not going to uh, repeat what we've been doing. We're talking about creativity, neuroses, we're talking about super yachts, supermodels, Supersize this, supersize that, super burgers, super soy, 
We're talking about Legionnaire's disease in San Quentin. I didn't mention that yet. But, gee, I wonder where that came from, the Legionnaire's disease in San Quentin, which will now, of course, spread to the sheriffs who have to take care of those lovely inmates there. And uh, Legionella, Kim Fire's top military leaders. Since taking over in 2011, he has ordered a series of purges and executions. Imagine that. And a dumb basketball player with tattoos went over there and said he's a nice fella. Great nation. The news is horrible. It's disgusting. It's a week of pain and sorrow with that maniac who shoots that young reporter and the sound man in his twisted, sick mind, Mr. Victimhood marching around. Whatever anyone said to him, he took as a, ra a racial slur. If someone said to him in the radio station, God, they're really out in the field with that one, he thought they were referring to, the, to, uh, to, to, re to uh, slavery. I, this guy was a nut. He fought with everyone, argued with everyone. They had to remove him. And then this poor woman was killed as a result of this maniac not being put into a nut house. Michael Savage newsletter, we must reopen the mental hospitals to deal with the homeless. I still stand by that remark. Just come to San Francisco and go to City Hall. Both inside and out City Hall, you'll see the, the wisdom in what I just said. Judge blocks Obama EPA rule as federal power grab over state waters. I don't even understand that story. Those kinds of stories don't appeal to me. Let's see what I have. Bye bye, Ronald. Obama's top labor arbiter dealt a blow to the franchise business. What else is new? Why should Obama's labor uh, arbiter want anyone to have a franchise or a business? All right, let's go to the callers. I got plenty of sound from Trump and others that I'm going to dump. 855-400-7282. Let's begin in, in Florida. W I'm glad I'm not. I almost went to Florida from New York. I was asked, do you want to go to Florida for a week after New York? And then I heard the Internet was causing trouble in my house. I said, no, I can't go through this. Thank God I came home and had only Internet trouble here where I'm at home, where I almost had three heart attacks yesterday. Uh, WFTL, Line 8, what's on your mind? Go ahead, please. Hey, I think you're in the wrong business. You should be on the stage doing stand-up. Wow, what a step up that would be, man. That's really a step up from being a famous author and broadcaster. That would be a real step up to be a stand-up comic. I couldn't wait for that one. Yeah, well, I'm from Schmendrick land, and I know hilarity when I hear it. <laughs> yeah, but why would I want to be a stand-up comedian when I am a famous author and broadcaster? Why would I want to go down the scale of success, the ladder of success? Oh, uh, no, Carl, you're too good for that. Anyhow, That's what I'm, I am too good for being a stand-up comedian. That's for guys like Bill Maher who can't do anything else. The they put a suit and a suit and tie on him, and he, we're supposed to think he's any different than uh, than the others in the, in the unknown comedy clubs. The only reason Bill Maher is where he is is because his twisted left-wing fanatical agenda uh, matches that of the bosses of HBO. Do you actually think he's funny? Well, the thing you did on Isaiah, on Isaiah just recently. Oh, that was funny, where, they, where I said basically he was jealous of the Israelis who were having a good time. Pure stand-up. It, it is funny, though. Was. Come on, people would, people would love to hear that in a nightclub. I get it. They'd love to have a drink and hear a guy say that about the, the biblical uh, prophets because the truth is they probably were miserable, horrible people. Yeah, Let me ask you something. If you, had a, if, you had a, if you had a choice, would you rather hang out, let's say, and have a drink with a guy like Isaiah from the Bible or the guy that Isaiah was putting down? Uh, I don't know. I think I'd, I'd be interested in Isaiah. He, he did, really? He, sounds interesting. he was a miserable human being. He said the world was coming to an end. The Jews were going to be thrown into exile because they misbehaved. God was mad at them because they were having too good a time. What kind of God is this that wants us to have a miserable time? Isn't it possible that God wants us to have a good time instead of a bad time? I hope he wants us to have a good time. I would hope so. What kind of God is it that wants us to be miserable every second? Isn't life hard enough? Shouldn't we have a good time once in a while? Yeah, I'm for that. That's all. <laughs> I think we ought to send a, uh, a petition to God saying that after millennia, it's time for him to revise his thinking of humanity. Give us a break. It's a, tough, it's a tough thing to get up every day. Shave, brush your teeth, have the juice, have the coffee, put on clothes, go to work, not hurt anybody, not hurt yourself, make a living, not do anything particularly uh, wrong. It's a hard thing. You've got to occasionally have a good time in the midst, in the midst of all of this. Okay, what do you want to... You, but thank you for that call. I'm not giving out copies of uh, Government Zero yet because they're not ready. After Labor Day, I'll have them in the warehouse for free giveaway. You could only get the limited first printing now on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. I can guarantee you I'll start reading it after Labor Day, but we have another week of uh, 
before the whole thing. When is Labor Day? It's next weekend already? I can't believe it. I don't go to parties. You go to a Labor Day party? I don't really do it. I stay home. I cook a hot dog. Maybe, you know, like a health dog. I don't eat the hot dogs. It's garbage. It's from the slaughterhouse floor. I don't like a tofu dog on the other side of it. I don't, because I don't like soy. Soy gives you breasts if you're a man. <laughs> Haven't you read the late? I love all of these guys who think that by eating soy based products, they're doing them. <laughs> they're doing themselves a favor. They have breasts, for God's sakes. They look like their grandmother from eating soy based products. You're not meant to eat soy. It's like that soy based foods are for people who can't afford meat, fish, or poultry. That's why the Asians had to have soy. Because they couldn't eat the animals that were providing them with the milk and the and the uh, and the wool, they didn't want to kill the livestock. Thank God that the soybean came along for them to develop into tofu, the most disgusting thing ever made. I, I don't like that stuff. It always makes you feel like uh, bloated. I can't digest just a bean curled up like that. Look, it's good for them if they think it's good. For, it really isn't. A, the uh, the estrogenic effects of soybean are well established. I'm trying to be serious now. I don't eat that crap. I won't eat it. I won't eat, it's just garbage. If you really want to have a meal so you don't eat that, what do you need it for? What do you want to talk about? Artists, I saw, oh, here's a guy I saved, Mark, line two. Go ahead. How did I save your life? Dr. Savage, I was listening to you in the 90s, and, and I'm, I'm a working artist, and um, I went through that whole period, you know, where I, I thought I was a little crazy, I thought I had anxiety, I went through all this stuff, I went to a psychiatrist, they put me on all these psych meds, and... Um, I listened to you one night. I was driving late at night, and you were on in this area late at night at that time. And and you had you were talking about you know the wild horses, you know, in your team, and you know. You oh the yes, indeedy. Did I ever see those horses in my team? Yeah. Go ahead, tell tell the audience that observation. One of my keen ones. Well, it it was it basically you you said that everybody has has this inside of them you have these wild horses and they're going to pull you in one direction or the other and and if you don't want to go in the wrong direction you just you you tame those horses you figure out how to change them you don't you don't pretend like they don't exist and exactly you don't block the horses that are in your head what you do is you harness them all together in a large team and you get a lead horse that listens to you and let the lead horse use the other horsepower to take you where you want to go, not where they want to go. Exactly. And, so what? And that observation that observation helped you rein in some of your more, let us say, uh, destructive horses. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was, uh, you know, I was I was divorced at the time. I was living in a little apartment. I mean, I was I was as low as you can get. And what? And where are you today? Today, I own a business, I have a beautiful wife, I have three young children, and I was just accepted in a very big art show in L.A., and I'm wow. every, I am doing everything that I dreamed of. I am working for myself, my wife and I homeschool our kids. Wait, are you uh, saying all, all of this is because you were able to recognize that you weren't crazy, that everyone had these multiple, let us say, entities within ourselves that were pulling us in many directions, and that you learned how to harness all of those voices, so to speak? I, I did, and I and and you know what? And what was was um, great. It's a great call. I love it. I, 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 I can't. You're breaking up a bit, but hey, Mark, thank you for that call. I remember when I came upon that observation. It's all my own. I was going through a very bad phase, and it really wrecked me. And uh, I don't want to go back and start with the crybaby stuff. But the fact is. It was because of affirmative action. They wouldn't hire brilliant white males. They only wanted the other type of people. Uh, and the fact is, is that it, it wrecked me. I worked all my life for that, what I wanted. I couldn't get it. I it, uh, had two young children, couldn't make a really good living. I didn't know which way to turn. And it does force a man to crack up. You know, it's one thing to, to not succeed when you've not done anything. It's quite another to not succeed when you've done everything right and you're really good at what you do. And the society says drop dead because of your race. That's really a bad place to be. And you become angry, you become depressed, you start to strike out, and then all of the other things start to happen. What, what I observed at that time was, and deep thinking was, if you read Shakespeare, and you look at all the characters that are in, in any of Shakespeare's plays, they ranges from the fool to the king, correct? And they're all voices in Shakespeare's head. So I said to myself, wait a minute, how does Shakespeare conjure up all these voices? How does he get a fool talking to a king and a wise man talking to a, a latrine operator? 
Where do they all come from? Well, they're all characters within his own mind. They're manifestations of Shakespeare.